Chapter Twenty of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: Odd but Interesting Characters. In these pages, the reader has seen familiar names, the favored of Lady Luck. But what of those who failed, the patient, plodding kind of whom you hear only on the scene? They too followed jackasses into hidden hills, made trails that led others to fortunes, which built cities, industries, railroad, endowed colleges, and made science function for a better world. To these humbler actors, we owe more than we can repay. For nearly half a century, John Cranky Casey roamed the deserts of California and Nevada looking for gold. His luck was consistently bad grim tall erect with a deep slow voice he was noted for picturesque speech which gained emphasis from an utterly humorless face congenitally he was an autocrat his speech biting a prospector whom casey didn't like died and friends were discussing the disposition of the remains chop his feet off suggested casey and drive him into the ground with a double jack from others one could always hear tales of fortunes made or missed of veins of gold wide as a barn door but no trick of memory ever turned casey's bull quartz into picture rock never found enough gold to fill a tooth he would say casey's leisure hours were spent over books and magazines chiefly highbrow particularly books and journals of science a tenderfoot was brought in unconscious from parump valley a city doctor happened to be passing through and after an examination of the victim turned to the men in overalls and hobnail shoes who'd brought him in he's suffering from a derangement of the hypothalamus why in the hell don't you say he had a heat stroke casey barked a notorious promoter had a city victim ready for the dotted line double your money in no time sample showed two hundred dollars to the ton assuming all prospectors were crooked he called to casey sitting nearby casey you know the indian tom claim yes i know it casey thundered not a fleck of gold in the whole damn hill in the thick silence that followed the beaten rascal flushed looked belligerently at casey but casey's big hard fists he knew could almost dent boilerplate and the long arms wrapped around a barrel could crush it flat in time casey acquired an ancient flivver only his genius as a mechanic kept it going there were lean years when it bore no license and he kept too little traveled roads the car like casey was cranky and phlegmatic one day as he was coming into shoshone it balked in the middle of the road coughed shivered and died inside the store it was a hundred and twenty degrees out on the road where casey stopped it was probably a hundred and thirty for two hours he patiently but vainly tried to coax it back to life finally he stood aside wiped the grease from his gnarled hands calmly stoked his pipe and shoved the car from the road then he gathered an armful of boulders and with a blasting of cussing that shook shoshone he let go with a cannonade of stones that completed its ruin at the age of ten casey had been taken from the drift of a city's backwash and put in an orphanage nothing was known of his parentage or of relatives he came to the desert after a colorful career as a conductor on the santa fe the late e w harriman having gained control of the southern pacific system had his private car attached to a santa fe train for an inspection tour at a siding on the mojave desert harriman wanted the train held a few moments his messenger went to casey explaining that harriman was the new boss of the southern pacific this is the santa fe casey bristled looking at his watch i'm due in barstow at eleven o five and by god i'll be there aboard his train he was a despot and a stickler for the rules demanding that even his superiors obey them this finally was his downfall and he came to the desert eleanor glenn who made the best seller list with three weeks in the early part of the century came to rawhide and tex rickard spectacular gambler undertook to show her a bit of life a la rawhide he took her to the stingaree district and later to a reception in his own place the state's notables were presented to the lady along with nat goodwin julian hawthorne and others internationally known 
tex saw casey standing alone at the end of the bar and knowing he was a voracious reader he went to casey come on and meet the author of three weeks i've read it casey said they's hung folks for less casey's method of getting a job when his grub ran out was unique and unfailing he would storm into the store and turn loose on charlie in charge of the roads and long his friend who's keeping up these roads chuck holden big as grand canyon disgrace been waiting for you to come in charlie would say with a sober face get a shovel and fix em a good conscientious worker casey would put the road in shape pay his debts and again head into the horizon you who spend through death valley or along its approaches owe much to casey who made many of the original roadbeds the hard way with pick and shovel at last casey got the old age pension and his latter years were the best his home a dugout in the bank of a wash near tacopa with no rent with books and magazines and the solitude he loved he lived happily when i croak he often said just put me in my dugout toss a stick of dynamite in after me shut the door and cave in the goddamn hill one night he went to tacopa friends were doing a spot of drinking and far behind in his score with the years casey joined them there was nothing out of line just yarns and memories and casey had a lot of these tonopah goldfield rawhide eli foundling days they put me in a religious school had no relatives in those days they whaled hell out of you just to see you squirm casey the teacher would ask who swallowed the whale how did i know then he'd drag me off by the ear and blister my bottom i shoved off one night been on the loose ever since as he drank from his bottle of beer he suddenly slumped and died instantly because of the intense heat maury sorrels now supervisor but then coroner ordered immediate burial someone recalled casey's wish to be put in the dugout and the hill blown up and started for the dynamite but whitey bill mcgarn warned that it would violate the law one-eyed casey no relation but long a friend suggested a wake until the grave was dug it will be daylight then and we'll plant him in the wash right in front of his dugout this was done as the sun came up over the hills and i like to think that somewhere in the afterlife all is well with casey ben brand previously mentioned was a big blond man with childlike blue eyes huge gnarled hands and the strength of an ox he wore enormous boots but when he bought new ones he always complained that they lacked traction and would go immediately to the dump salvage an old tire casing and add two inches of reinforcement to the soles with half a pound of hobnails ben then was ready for travel provided he could find his burrows near remote quail springs ben dug a four by four mine shaft seventy-five feet deep without aid descending by ladder he would fill a ten-gallon bucket with dirt climb out and bring it to the surface day after day month after month ben applied the power of two strong arms and two strong legs with an engine you could do it in half the time ben was told well, i've got plenty of time ben drawled ben disdained gold in quartz formation i like placer it's a poor man's game if you find gold you put it in your poke and you've got spending money ben kept five burrows and being industrious never lacked a grub state he avoided argument except upon one subject and that was burrows versus fords in prospecting i can get anywhere with my burrows i find stalled flivvers all over the desert and my burrows drag em in ben believed that a burrow had at least some of the intellectual powers of man read a clock as good as you he said i worked my burrow solomon on a hoist he didn't like it i got up every morning at daylight by an alarm clock slept out and kept the clock on a boulder at my head and got up when the alarm went off one morning i woke up with the sun shining straight down in my eyes it was noon that burrow had sneaked up and taken that clock down the canyon a mile away don't tell me they can't think i sold him too smart i asked ben once what he would do if he suddenly found a million dollar claim i would build a monument a thousand feet high on top of telescope peak and dedicate it to burrows such a monument would inadequately express the debt today's world owes that little beast here are some of the things that link your life to the burrow 
the springs and the mattress in the bed you were born on the talc that powdered you the soap that bathed you the ring you slipped on the finger of the girl you loved the paint on your house the glass in your windows the tile in your bathroom the enameled ware in your kitchen the prescription your druggist fills the fillings the dentist puts into your teeth the coin and the currency you spend the auto you ride in and finally the casket in which you leave this world wars have been won or lost and the credit of nations stabilized because a borough carried a prospector's grub into faraway hills ben's borough strayed and he'd just returned with them after a two days hunt he was sitting on the bench mopping his brow when louise grantham the girl with the mine in the panament came up she needed pack animals to get the ore down to the road she'd tried before to trade her ford pickup for ben's burrows but he'd never shown a flicker of interest in a voice pitched for ben's ears she said to ernie hoon if ben didn't waste so much time hunting those jacks he might find a mine ben cocked an ear but made no comment now take that quail springs hole louise went on if he had my pickup he could take off a wheel put on a belt and haul up the muck in one tenth of the time and instead of hoofing it on the sun he could ride in a cool cab and haul his supplies in there comes a weak moment in every one's life and this was ben's he traded the burrows for the ford and one of the best prospectors on the desert was ruined forever ben had a mortal fear of women and nothing could convince him that any unattached woman wasn't always lying in wait for any loose man ben went into the johnny country to prospect and passing through i looked him up he was living in a tin shack in the canyon leading up to the old johnny mine i asked ben about his luck last prospecting i did was right out there he pointed to the slope in front of his house good placer ground too why did you quit woman ben grumbled don't know yet what came over me but i took a woman for a partner he pointed to a boulder a few hundred yards away that's where i wanted to start digging it's rich dirt she wanted to start up there near her shack well what difference did it make i asked i see you don't know women i hadn't been working up there by her house no time before she called me to get her a bucket of water bucket was half full next day she wanted a board in the kitchen floor nailed down didn't need any nail there's some fresh apple pie on the table she says i told her i didn't like pie i'm crazy about pie but i knew her game she calculated if i ate with her two or three times i'd be a dead pigeon so i told her she could have the claim and walked off ben struck a happier note when he informed me that he didn't need to work any more and at last had attained the one ambition of his life come inside and i'll show you beaming as only a man can when he sits on top of the world he approached a table and it flashed over me that i would see a certified check for a fortune there was a cloth over the table and he carefully wiped his big hands before touching it he wet his big broad thumb and forefinger and gave them an extra swipe on the sides of his shirt a wide smile on his face and i had a vicarious thrill that a man who could barely read and write had at last achieved that which he most wanted in life he started to remove the cloth but paused I always said if i ever struck it rich first money i spent would be for one of these dinkuses he flipped the cloth aside and i stared incredulous it was a portable typewriter he replaced the cover with the gentle care of a mother putting her baby to bed and i left him sure that god was in his heaven with an eye on ben contemporary with ben was joe volmer who lived in a dugout in dublin gulch i had seen royalty from afar and once i had dined with a sultan on horse meat and fried bananas but no king ever attained the majesty of joe he was tall erect wore a white sailor's hat and carried a cane his moustache was always waxed to a needle point after the manner of kaiser wilhelm though he increased his small pension by selling home brew he always managed to give the impression that he was descending to your level when he accepted the two bits you left on his table he was neat as he was lordly and forever scrubbing his pots and pans he kept the dugout immaculate and when i first saw him standing on the ledge in front of his door calmly surveying the valley below he posed like an alexander the great with the world conquered and trust at his feet 
i had never seen him until one day a tourist came into the store and asked charlie for a stopwatch charlie told him he didn't carry stopwatches shortly after the tourist had gone joe came in for a stopwatch don't keep em charlie said hell of a store joe barked and strode out a curious coincidence i said two calls for a stopwatch in the same day away out here it's no coincidence charlie said just joe volmer he's in every day asking for something he knows i haven't got after joe left jack crawley came for his mail brown was in the cage set apart for the post office he had just received several sheets of six cent stamps twice as many as he needed jack he said when you see joe tell him i'm out of six cent stamps within an hour joe shoved a five dollar bill through the window give me five dollars worth of six cent stamps he ordered brown picked up the bill filled the order and never again did joe ask for merchandise not in stock joe sold a claim and decided he needed a refrigerator to keep the beer cold so he picked up a monkey ward catalogue and ordered a big white enamel number large enough for a hotel joe thought a refrigerator was just a refrigerator and he strutted around telling everybody he had to widen the dugout door and waiting customers were more than eager to help him get the machine in place he loaded the shelves and told them to come back in a couple of hours and cool their innards they came with their tongues hanging out joe set out the glasses and passed the bottles herman jones picked one up and shook it the cork hit the ceiling hotter than hell herman said what sort of cooler is that he went over and looked gas you damn fool nearest gas is barstow until joe's death he used the refrigerator to store pots and pans discovered in his dugout in a serious condition joe was rushed to death valley junction twenty-eight miles away where the pacific coast borax company maintained a hospital which was in charge of dr shrum who was rather realistic and somewhat cold-blooded just as they had gotten joe in the doctor's office another patient was brought in dr shrum looked at the newcomer and then at joe take joe out he ordered he's going to die anyway joe was wheeled outside and a moment later was dead george williams a spanish-american war veteran retired to shoshone on a pension of fifty dollars since food was cheap george had more money than he knew what to do with he kept five burros he never prospected but roamed the country and thought nothing of taking a three hundred mile trip across the roughest terrain in the region after spending his summers in the high country he would return to shoshone in winter there he had a five-acre ranch fenced in and a neat cabin every day george would come to the store and buy a pound of chocolates i've got a sweet tooth he would explain charlie sure that no one could eat as much chocolate as george bought was a bit curious as to what george did with it and trailed him one day through the mesquite to find george feeding the candy to his burrows george was not a drinker but on one occasion he joined a party and went on a bender he awoke next morning with a horrible hangover and was so humiliated that he left shoshone and never returned he went over to sandy and died in the thirties one day george started to tell me a story as we sat on the bench his burrows were grazing in the nearby salt grass every time he reached the climax of his yarn he would jump up to go after a straying burrow when he retrieved that one another would wander off and george would leave me again for one entire summer i listened to the beginning of that yarn and every morning would remind him of it where was i he'd say oh yes i was telling you about the girl climbing out of the fellow's window just before daylight well she went and then george would jump up and start after a burrow and i never learned what happened to the torrid romance after the girl crawled out of her lover's window End of chapter twenty Chapter twenty one of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one Roads Cracker Box Signs. Any resemblance that a Death Valley highway bore to a road was a coincidence prior to nineteen twenty six, and few tourists traveled over them unless two cars were along. Just follow the wheel tracks and keep your eyes peeled for the cracker box signs along the road was the usual advice to the novice who didn't know that tracks left by mormon wagons nearly a century before may be seen today 
one of these led me to the bank of a mile-wide gash made by cloudbursts to locate the missing link i climbed the nearest mountain and on a lonely mesa came at last upon a piece of shook nailed to a stake and stuck into the ground but it had nothing to do with roads a crude inscription read montana jim july eighteen eighty eight a damn good pal reverently i stepped aside never again would i see a finer tribute to a man a few rocks bleached white in the sun outlined a sunken grave crossed upon it were jim's pick and shovel it was not difficult to recreate what had happened there jim and his friend looking for gold jim's faltering and the sun beating him down jim's partner knowing that jim's moniker would identify him better than a surname to anyone who passed that way interested in jim out in the desert a hundred miles from human habitation he couldn't call an undertaker so he dug a hole wrapped jim in his canvas rolled him in and hoped that god would reach down for jim at that period it was not an uncommon experience for the early tourist to lose his way by doing the natural thing at a crossroads and take the one which showed the sign of most travel often he would find later that he had followed a trail to a mine miles away often too it led to disaster the story of roads begins at shoshone with brown in his trips in and around the valley he erected signs to prevent the traveler from losing his way and his life i would like to see death valley country people would say to him but everyone tells me to stay out inyo county had little revenue and that was used in the more populous owens valley a hundred and fifty miles west the east side the shoshone area was totally neglected letters and petitions protesting the unfair distribution of county funds were tossed into the waste basket roads in that cauldron who would use em nobody ever goes there but a few old prospectors this was true but it was also true that on owens valley's west side the lakes and forests of the high sierra were attracting a paying crop of vacationists and the supervisors knew it would be political suicide to divert this traffic from its towns and resorts the county-wide opinion as to chance for relief was expressed in the slang of the day by a loafer on the bench at shoshone about as much as a wax mouse would have against an asbestos cat in a race through hell they have the votes and elect the supervisors the east side had never had a member on the board in the shoshone precinct were less than forty voters in death valley a few prospectors who would have battered down the gates of hell if they thought gold lay beyond poked around in its canyons a few indians a few workmen for the borax company in 1924, Brown put his suitcase in his car, filled the tank, and said to those about, Fellas, I'm running for supervisor. You'll be the mouse, quipped a friend. I'll let him know somebody lives over here anyway. Skirting the urban strongholds of the gentleman in office, Brown knocked at every door in the district. He berated none, nor claimed he had all the answers to an obviously difficult problem. Roads built there will lead here. Everybody will win then to the next cabin and the next canyon until he'd seen every voter before the opposition knew he had been around he was back in shoshone selling bacon and beans when the votes were counted the overlords of the west side gasped who the hell's this brown didn't even know he was running taking office january first nineteen twenty five he found that the beaten incumbent had spent all the money allocated for road maintenance in his own bailiwick before retiring nevertheless brown convinced the new board his election proved that the people of the entire county agreed with him that the death valley area could no longer be neglected and managed to get a niggardly appropriation which would not have built a mile of decent mountain road and his district had three challenging mountain ranges to cross with this appropriation he was expected to care for a mileage four times greater than that of the west side and was thus responsible for not only eastern approaches but maintenance of a hundred and fifty miles of road from darwin all roads in the valley and those which furnish the north and south approaches he managed to get five thousand dollars after two years with this he procured road machinery on a rental basis and succeeded in making a fair desert road then he began a one-man crusade to exploit death valley as a tourist attraction 
we need only roads a tourist can travel he worked just as diligently for all of Inyo's roads we have one of the world's best vacation lands he told the west siders you have an abundance of beautiful lakes and streams in a setting of mountains impressive as any in the world on our side we offer the appeal of the panamint the funeral range and spectacular death valley tourists will come to both of us if we give them a chance and they will be our best crop by nineteen twenty six his crusade for roads had spread beyond inyo county lines san bernardino county through which passes highway sixty six a main transcontinental artery joins inyo on the south its board of supervisors was in session one day when brown strode in most of them he knew he wanted their advice he told them your county and mine need more roads to bring more people the easiest way into death valley is through your county from baker the distance from baker to the inyo county line is forty five miles if you will build a road to the Inyo line, I will build it from that point to Furnace Creek, 71 miles. Such a road would open Death Valley to the public, and the tourists who will travel will spend enough money in your towns to pay your share of the cost. San Bernardino supervisors agreed to consider it, but were not enthusiastic. One of America's largest counties, San Bernardino, had also one of its largest road problems brown kept plugging arranging meetings convincing residents that the county's portion of the road would be over flat country and over roads already passable and its construction inexpensive finally san bernardino county supervisors agreed and by april nineteen twenty nine he had seventy one miles of passable road the result was that death valley was no longer remote as the congo and tourists began to come to Shoshone, it meant a few more windshields to wipe, a few more cars to crawl under. Another soft answer to frame for the sightseer cursing the desolation. Another shed for the store that started on the kitchen table. In 1932, Brown went before the State Highway Commission and urged that all the roads he had built in Death Valley be taken over by the state. The law was passed death valley became a national monument february eleventh nineteen thirty three by order of president franklin roosevelt at that time america was groping its way through depression worrying about its dinner and its debts as a result of the stock market crash of nineteen twenty nine in the nation's hobo jungles the seasoned bindle staff made room for the newcomer who had always lived on the right side of the tracks Freight trains carried a new kind of bum when the adolescent female crawled into a car alongside an adolescent male, vainly seeking work anywhere at anything. To save them and others like them, CCC camps were organized, and one of these, recruited largely from New York City's Bowery, was sent to Death Valley with headquarters at Cow Creek, a few miles north of Furnace Creek Inn. The new park was under the supervision of Colonel John R. White, later superintendent of the entire national park system and to ray goodwin assistant superintendent was assigned the task of building additional roads and trails to points of interest to connect with the state system which brown had built then began in earnest the flow of tourist traffic to the godforsaken hole for which brown had worked for fourteen long and difficult years but he soon found that to the problem of a small desert community he had added those of a whole county they were the aftermath of what has since been called in a marvelous understatement by murrow mayo historian of los angeles the rape of owens valley in the early part of the century the city of los angeles had secretly acquired nearly all sources of water in inyo and mono counties an amazed world applauded the engineering feat by which water was siphoned over mountain ranges to flow through ditches and tunnels a distance of two hundred and fifty nine miles the enterprise was announced by its promoters as the answer to the desperate need for water it is now known that this need was only a mask to hide a scheme to make los angeles pay the cost of bringing water to a hundred and eight thousand acres of waterless land in san fernando valley so that the owners could make a profit of a hundred million dollars through its subdivision and sale this they did 
the shameful story glorifies by comparison the cattle wars of the early west when one side hired its billy the kids to kill off the other the only difference being that in the owens valley feud the billy the kids were the big names of los angeles who used unscrupulous politicians and laws cunningly passed instead of six guns as a consequence, Los Angeles owns the towns, ranches, and cattle ranches, so that merchants, householders, ranchers, and renters have no title, except in a relatively few instances, to the land upon which they live, or to the house or store they occupy. Los Angeles could sell or lease, or refuse to sell or lease, land to cattlemen, homes to residents, or stores to merchants, and sell, or refuse to sell, water to those who had lived all their lives and would die on the devastated land. As a result, the relations between the city and the displaced persons of the two counties were those of victor and vanquished in nineteen thirty five the city succeeded in getting an act passed by the legislature which prevented any town from becoming incorporated without the consent of sixty per cent of the property owners the purpose of the act seemed fair enough when it was announced that it was designed to save the towns from both political demagogues and crackpots running amuck in california and it became a law but there was more than the eye could see its real objective had been to strengthen the stranglehold of the Los Angeles Water and Power Board upon Owens Valley. Since it owned the towns, it could now prevent their incorporation. There had been some feeling of security under a resolution of the Water and Power Board, which had declared that merchants, cattlemen, and residents, all of them lessees, would be given preference in new leases and renewals of old ones in 1942 the resolution became a scrap of paper and ranchers cattlemen and householders were advised that their leases would hereafter be renewed by a method of secret bidding thus the residents of owens valley learned that the labor of years had brought no security as one beaten old timer told me we've been kicked around so much i'm used to it i helped blow those ditches two three times to turn that water loose on the desert i know when i'm licked resentment in mono county which provided more of the water taken by los angeles than inyo was even more aroused and smoldering hatreds were ready again to blow up a ditch the two counties constitute the twenty eighth senatorial district brown's success in the assembly had not gone unnoticed in the neighboring county of mono we need that fellow brown a prominent citizen said and others repeated it Again, Charlie put his suitcase in his car, filled the tank. We've never had anybody from this side at Sacramento, he told a friend standing by. I'm running for the Senate. Know anybody up there? I'm going and get acquainted, he said, and headed across the valley. Most of Mono County is isolated by the High Sierras. Again, the door-to-door -door technique. No torches, no brass bands, just the old eye-to-eye -eye, talk it over system. As always, he let the voter do the talking, and he listened, but when he slid into his car, the voter was ready to tell his neighbor, I like that fella. Doesn't claim to know it all. He told his banker, his grocer, his butcher, baker, and barber. Result? I was in the Senate chamber at Sacramento later, when I heard one of a group of men huddled nearby say, This is an important bill that concerns everybody on the east side of the Sierras. We better see Charlie. I nudged the man reading a document at my side. Those fellows want to see you, Senator. He had received the nomination of both the Democratic and Republican parties and had secured the passage of an act which denies a municipality holding more than 50% of the property of another subdivision of the state proprietary power over the security and stability of such subdivision. Moreover, he was on the all-powerful rules committee, the fish and game, local government, natural resources, social welfare, and election committees, friend and frequent advisor of Governor Warren. Honeymooning Secretary Ix was combining business with pleasure when he reached California, and wanting to see how his park system was functioning, he took his bride to see Death Valley. Besides, he had some plans affecting the Inyo area. The fight was having tough sledding in the legislature, despite President Roosevelt's approval. Then he talked to the people less biased. You'd better see Charlie. Who the hell's Charlie? asked Harold, senator from Death Valley. 
with ray goodwin superintendent of the death valley monument to guide him he was taken to all the show places now said mr ix i want to see brown at shoshone charlie's toggery is strictly for work which includes tending the gas pump stove repairing plumbing and what have you he was flat on his back under the dripping oil of a bulky car when mr goodwin stepped from the limousine charlie mr goodwin called mr ix is here to see you receiving no answer he walked over to the car and added that mr ix was in a hurry still no answer it's secretary ix department of the interior this is important so's this brown grunted when he'd finished he crawled out and wiping the grime from his hands joined goodwin at the waiting car after being introduced to the bride and the self-styled old curmudgeon the latter explained his plan to add certain lands in charlie's district to the forest service you're opposing me you're a democrat aren't you i came from georgia charlie drawled you're for roosevelt aren't you within reason charlie answered then mr ix with the assurance of the perfectionist began to sell his idea do you know of any reason why the area designated as forest reserve should not be protected as any other of our natural resources he concluded just one charlie said what's that ix snapped your forest is nearly all brushland without a tree on it big enough to shade a lizard charlie was similarly dressed when a well-tailored and impatient tourist with a carload of friends whom he was evidently trying to impress drove up for gas always unhurried charlie came to the pumps slowly reached for the hose and as lazily checked the oil say fella the tourist barked senator brown is a friend of mine get a move on or you'll be looking for a job without the flicker of an eyelid charlie quickened jumped for a cleaning rag and briskly polished the windshield when he brought the tourist change he apologized for his slowness and begged him not to report it to senator brown jobs are hard to get and i have a wife and ten children to support touched with remorse the tourist looked at the chains just give it to the kids and forget it when the pacific coast borax company built its swanky furnace creek inn on the western slope of the funeral range overlooking death valley it began to look about for places that would give the most spectacular and comprehensive view of the big sink as a means of entertaining guests and far enough away to keep them from boredom all the old-timers who had wandered over the ranges were called in each suggested the place that had impressed him more than others each of these places was visited and after weeks of deliberation a spot on chloride cliff toward the northern end of death valley was chosen and the big wigs started back to los angeles when they stopped at shoshone for gas and water clarence razor an engineer of the company was still thinking of the chosen site and asked brown long his friend if he knew of any view of the valley better than the one at chloride cliff i don't pay much attention to scenery he told razor to me it's just desert or mountain but i know one view that made me stop and look kind of got me the chances are most folks would rave over it could you find it sure could razor called the others repeated charlie's story and added you're in a hurry but knowing charlie as i do i believe we'd better turn around and go back if he'll guide us charlie agreed it was a long torturous climb even to the base of the peak there charlie went ahead and then beckoned them holding to bushes they walked or crawled to stand beside him took one look and caught their breath a mile below them lay the awesome sink white salt beds spread like a shroud over its silent desolation billowed dunes gold against the dark of lava rock here a pasteled hill there a brooding canyon beyond the colorful panament under the golden glow of the sun this is the place they said you can tell em too said charlie pointing that right down there is copper canyon if such stuff interests them they can see the footprints of the camels and elephants and a lot of historic junk like that so you who thrill at dante's view may thank charles brown of shoshone when first elected to the senate his colleagues were quick to see the qualities that had appealed to voters when they elected him supervisor he had frequently been before that body in his fight for roads and tax reforms 
they knew too that better schools for all rural areas either wholly or largely were the result of his efforts and soon he was on the rules committee a place usually assigned to those who come from the more populous districts of the state because its five members through its power to appoint all standing and special committees largely decides what legislation reaches the governor in 1950, Brown announced his candidacy for re-election under the state law that enables a candidate to seek the nomination of two parties. The slot machine had been outlawed in California by the previous legislature, and Brown had been largely instrumental in securing the passage of the law. Since the slot machine is a $3 billion business in the nation, the gamblers opposed him as part of a general plan to secure repeal of the law and reinstate the one-armed bandits since mono county adjoins nevada gambling interests of that state contributed without stint to retire brown to private life he had been in office for twenty-five years and opposed by this powerful group guided by both brains and cunning the odds apparently were against him while the opposition boasted that he was through brown was calling at cabins in the hills and gulches meeting friends on busy village streets and again when the vote was counted it was discovered that voters have memories he had won the nomination of both the democratic and republican parties by almost two to one and under the law was re-elected due to his priority standing and the retirement of older senators the big fellow who walked a hundred and fifty miles to get a job at greenwater in order to save the fare to eat on automatically shares with two men the power to control the legislation of the state hell like gold is where you find it either in people or places a lady of wealth and aristocratic background en route to furnace creek's luxury inn stopped at shoshone for gas worn out by the long drive over the corduroy road she looked about her and then at charlie in greasy overalls how on earth she asked in genuine distress do you make a living in this godforsaken hole oh it's hard ma'am charlie said gloomily but we get a few pennies from tourists a little flour from mesquite beans and stay alive one way or another hoping to get out the gracious lady opened her purse thrust a five-dollar bill into charlie's hand and went her way it really made her happy charlie chuckled and i just didn't have the heart to give it back what is it that man wants of these god-forsaken holes on the desert i sought the answer one day when shoshone was having a holiday george ishmael as native as an indian was chosen to barbecue the steer a well-to-do tourist begged the job of digging the big pit want to flex my muscles another cut the wood at a depth of four feet water was struck and rose a foot over the bottom oh that's all right george said he tossed a dozen railroad ties into the hole floated them into position covered them with dirt built the fire lowered the carcass of the steer covered it with green leaves and filled the hole an unforgettable feast agreed the scores who had come from places a hundred miles away sitting beside me was a prominent los angeles attorney eminent in the councils of the democratic party in both state and nations why he asked will a man wear himself out in the city when he can really live in a little place like this well, i thought of suicide at first said patsy young matron with three healthy little stair steps my husband said for heaven's sake go out for a month and have a good time i went back in a week a vermont girl said she had come to escape a straight-laced code that constantly reminded her sin was everywhere here i've got an even break with the devil all had found something that clicked with something inside of them which challenged something in civilization maybe it was expressed in the dogma of the tennessee judge reared in the hill country of the cumberland river as he stepped from his plane on his annual vacation he was cornered by a reporter judge you're ninety-four years old what do you think of this modern world best one i know about no criticism none whatever maybe a few minor changes just now we are being educated out of common sense into ignorance laud out of patriotism taxed into poverty doctored to death and preached to hell End of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two Lost Mines 
the brayfogle and others the most famous lost mine in the death valley area is the lost brayfogle there are many versions of the legend but all agree that somewhere in the bowels of those rugged mountains is a colossal mass of gold which jacob brayfogle found and lost jacob brayfogle was a prospector who roamed the country around pioche and austin nevada with infrequent excursions into the death valley area he traveled alone indian george hungry bill and panamint tom saw brayfogle several times in the country around stovepipe wells but they could never trace him to his claim when followed george said brayfogle would step off the trail and completely disappear once george told me about trailing him into the funeral range he pointed to the bear mountain him there me see pretty quick he paused puckered his lips whoop no see brayfogle left a crude map of his course all lost mines must have a map conspicuous on this map are the death valley buttes which are landmarks because he was seen so much here it was assumed that his operations were in the low foothills i have seen a rough copy of this map made from the original in possession of wild rose frank kennedy's squaw lizzie brayfogle presumably coming from his mine was accosted near stovepipe wells by panamint tom hungry bill and a young buck related to them known as johnny hungry bill from habit begged for food brayfogle refused explaining that he had but a morsel and several hard days journey before him on his burrow he had a small sack of ore when brayfogle left hungry bill said him no good incited by hungry bill and a possible loot the indians followed brayfogle for three or four days across the range hungry bill stopped en route sent the younger indians ahead at stump springs east of shoshone brayfogle was eating his dinner when the indians sneaked out of the brush and scalped him took what they wished of his possessions and left him for dead ash meadows charlie a chief of the indians in that area confided to herman jones that he had witnessed this assault this happened on the yunt ranch or as it is better known the man's ranch yunt and aaron winters accidentally came upon brayfogle unconscious on the ground the scalp wound was fly-blown they had a mule team and light wagon and hurried to san bernardino with the wounded man the ore a chocolate quartz was thrown into the wagon i saw some of it at fee lee's home the resting spring ranch shorty harris said it was the richest ore i ever saw fifty pounds yielded nearly six thousand dollars brayfogle recovered but thereafter was regarded as slightly off he returned to austin nevada and the story followed wild rose frank kennedy an experienced mining man obtained a copy of brayfogle's map and combed the country around the buttes in an effort to locate the mine kennedy had the aid of the indians and was able to obtain through his squaw lizzie such information as indians had about the going and coming of the elusive brayfogle some believe the ore came from around daylight springs shorty said but old lizzie's map had no mark to indicate daylight springs but it does show the buttes and the only buttes in death valley are those above stovepipe wells kennedy interested henry e findlay an old-time colorado sheriff and clarence nyman for years a prospector for coleman and smith the pacific borax company they induced matt collin a rich salt lake mining man to leave his business and come out they made three trips into the valley looking for that gold it's there somewhere in austin brayfogle was outfitted several times to relocate the property but when he reached the lower elevation of the valley he seemed to suffer some aberration which would end the trip his last grub staker was not so considerate he told brayfogle that if he didn't find the mine promptly he'd make a sieve of him and was about to do it when a companion named atchison intervened and saved his life shortly afterward brayfogle died from the old wound indian george repeating a story told him by panamint tom once told me that tom had traced brayfogle to the mine and after brayfogle's death went back and secured some of the ore tom guarded his secret he covered the opening with stone and leaving walked backwards obliterating his tracks with a greasewood brush 
later when tom returned prepared to get the gold he found that a cloudburst had filled the canyon with boulders gravel and silt removing every landmark and brayfogle's mine was lost again some day maybe george said big rain come and wash em out among the freighters of the early days was john delameter who believed the brayfogle was in the lower panament delameter operated a twenty mule team freighting service between daggett and points in both death valley and panamint valley he told me that he found brayfogle down in the road about twenty-eight miles south of ballarat with a wound in his leg brayfogle had come into the panamint from pioche nevada and said he had been attacked by indians his horses stolen while working on his claim which he located merely with a gesture toward the mountains subsequently delameter made several vain efforts to locate the property but like most lost mines it continues to be lost but for years it was good bait for a grub stake and served both the convincing liar and the honest prospector nearly all old-timers had a version of the lost brayfogle differing in details but all agreeing on the chocolate quartz and its richness that brayfogle really lost a valuable mine there can be little doubt but since he is authentically traced from the northern end of death valley to the southern and since the chocolate quartz is found in many places of that area one who cares to look for it must cover a large territory one mine that had never been found turned up in a way as amazing as most of them are lost at pios nevada an assayer was suspected of giving greater values to samples than they merited it is known as the come on in order to trap the suspect a prospector broke off a piece of old grindstone and ordered an assay if he gives that any value it's proof enough he's a crook he told his friends proof of guilt came with the assayer's report the grindstone was incredibly rich in silver it said we've got the goods on him now the outraged prospector announced and it was decided to give the assayer a coat of tar and feathers wiser counsellor was accepted however and it was decided to give him no more business the fellow was faced with the alternative of starving or leaving the country when he learned the reason of the boycott conscious of no error in his work he made another and more careful assay this time the samples yielded even higher values it was agreed by all mining engineers of that day that rock like the samples never carried silver or gold but the assayer knew his furnace hadn't lied and he couldn't believe grindstone makers were mixing silver with sand to make the stones so he traced the grindstone to the quarry it came from the result was the silver king one of the richest silver mines a survivor of the jayhawkers or the bennett arcane party of forty nine it is not clear to which he belonged after escaping death in the valley saw a deer or antelope and on the point of starvation took his gun from its trap to shoot the animal seeing that the sight had been lost he picked up a thin piece of shale and wedged it in the sight slot later he took the weapon to a gunsmith who removed the makeshift sight and upon examination found it to be almost pure silver where i picked it up said the owner there was a mountain of it so begins the history of the lost gun sight and the story spread as stories will until ten years later it reached the ears of dr darwin french of oroville previously mentioned the doctor became excited and in the spring of eighteen sixty organized a party to locate the fabulous mountain of silver though he searched bravely he failed to find it however he brought back the first authentic account of what others with a flair for lost mines could expect in the way of weather topography indians edible game vegetation and water on this trip however he discovered silver in the coso range the following year eighteen sixty one dr s g george who had been with the french party decided he could find the lost gun site and organized an expedition which crossed panamint valley explored wild rose canyon and reached the highest point in death valley but dr george's valiant efforts were no luckier than those of dr french william manley author of death valley in forty nine also tried but gained only another tragic experience and came nearer losing his life than he did with the forty-niners 
lost and without water and beaten to his knees he was deserted by companions and escaped death by a miracle how many have lost their lives trying to find the gun site no one knows there are scores of sunken mounds on lonely mesas which an old-timer will explain tersely it was looking for the gun sight dr french after his failure pursued another and even more intriguing lost mine with a ready ear for tales of treasure he heard of a tribe of indians in the death valley area who were making bullets for their rifles out of gold accordingly he organized another party to find the gold for eleven months dr french and his hand-picked comrades combed the country the gold they found would have loaded no gun but you may add the lost bullet to your list of lost mines a member of this party was john searles for whom searles lake is named because early prospectors searched for Brayfogle's lost mine throughout the region where he was found scalped an interesting digression is not amiss a few miles east of shoshone there is a gun sight mine named of course by the discoverer in the hope that he'd found the one so long lost it adjoins the noonday and was a valuable property which belonged to dr d l godchell of victorville the noonday produced five million dollars and was operated until silver and lead took a price dive a twelve-mile railroad was built from tacopa to haul the ore the steel rails were later hauled away and the ties went into construction of desert homes sheds fences and firewood for years the two properties could have been bought for what have you then came pearl harbor and a young kentuckian buford davis looking around for lead or any essential ores that uncle sam could use dropped off at shoshone charles brown told him of the gun site and the noonday davis inspected the properties bought them for a relatively small down payment he chose to begin operations on the noonday and sent ernie hun an experienced miner to deepen the shaft honest to god ernie told me i hadn't dug a foot when i turned up the prettiest vein of lead i'd ever seen in the next six years the noonday produced approximately a gross of nine million dollars and a net of probably six million dollars these figures were given me by don kempfer mining engineer and shoshone resident from estimates which he believes accurate in 1947 with the rich rewards attained but as yet unenjoyed buford davis made a hurried airplane trip to salt lake returning he was only a few moments from a safe landing when the plane crashed and all aboard were killed today in 1950 the property belongs to anaconda and is considered one of the most valuable mines for those interested in lost mines i offer the list that follows the names are my own the lost chinaman when john searles was struggling to make a living out of the ooze that is called searles lake he had a mule skinner known as salty bill parkinson a fearless hard-bitten individual who was the paul bunyan of death valley teamsters while loading a wagon with borax salty bill and searles noticed a man staggering down from the slate range they decided he was supercharged with desert liquor and paid scant attention as he wobbled across the flat from the base of the range a moment later he fell at their feet they saw that he was a chinaman that his tongue was swollen his eyes red and sunken that he clutched at his throat in a vain effort to speak he could make no intelligible sound and lapsed into unconsciousness they thought he had died and was left on their hands for burial salty bill afterwards stated that he'd said to searles fremont carson or the mormons old bill williams for whom bill williams river bill williams mountain and the town of williams arizona are named was at resting springs he'll spoil in an hour i'll go for a shovel while you choose a place to plant him i'd actually turned to go when searles called me back searles had seen some sign of life and after removing a canvas bag strapped to his body they took him to a nearby shed gave him a few spoonfuls of water and eventually he was restored to consciousness he lay in a semi-stupor all the afternoon and was obsessed with the idea that he was going to die his chief concern was to get to mojave so that he could take a stage for a seaport and die in china or failing arrange for the burial of his bones with those of his ancestors 
he had been working at old harmony borax works picking cotton ball borax with other chinese employed by the company but tiring of abuse by a tough boss he'd asked for his wages and walked out some paiutes told him of a short cut across the panamint and this he took en route he picked up a piece of rich float stuck it into his bag farther on his journey he ran out of water and became hopelessly lost he managed to reach the slate range however and from the summit saw searles lake though in no condition to stand the rough trip to mojave he begged to be sent there and yielding finally salty bill ready to leave with his load threw the chinaman on his wagon and started on his trip before reaching mojave the chinaman's condition became worse and salty bill stopped the team in answer to his yells the canvas sack lay alongside the stricken chinaman and reaching for it he brought out a lump of ore never in my life said salty bill have i seen ore like that the chinaman gave the ore to salty thanked him for his friendly treatment told him that at a place in the panamint where the big timber pitches down into a steep canyon he had found the float again he expressed his belief that he was going to die and extracted a promise from salty that if death came before reaching mojave salty would see that his remains be shipped to china adding that any chinaman in mojave would provide money if needed you find the gold and keep it he told salty for me no good no can the journey was completed and salty learned that the chinaman did die at mojave and that a countryman there saw that the remains were sent to the flowery kingdom salty bill showed the ore to john searles and searles usually indifferent to yarns of hidden ledges was even more excited than salty for four or five years the two men made trips in search of the place where big timber pitches into a canyon after these other tireless prospectors sought the elusive ledge but the lost chinaman is still lost the lost wagon jim hurley went to parker arizona broke he wanted quick money and was looking for placer the storekeeper was a friend of jim and had previously staked him i'm looking for a place to wash out some gold but i've no money and no grub jim was told of a butte on the colorado desert it's good placer ground and you ought to pan a few dollars without much trouble he provided jim with bacon and beans and feed for his burrows jim set out found the butte but no gold and decided to try a new location on the way out he saw behind some bushes an old wagon that seemed to be half buried in blow sand thinking it would be a good feeding place for his burrows he went over on the ground nearby he saw the bleached skeleton of a man he threw aside a half-rotted tarpaulin in the wagon bed and discovered fifteen sacks of ore it was obvious that the wagon had stood there for a long time he examined the ore and saw that it was rich and of a peculiar color he loaded the ore on his burrows returned to parker and sent it to the smelter he received in return eighteen hundred dollars losing no time jim returned to find the source of the ore and though for the next five years he looked at intervals for a quartz to match that found in the wagon he could find nothing that even resembled it where it came from no prospector on the desert would even venture an opinion but all declared they had seen no quartz of that peculiar color and all of them knew the country from mexico to nevada but jim added to his store an adventure and a memory and there is no treasure in this life richer than a memory the lost goller this i believe is a lost mine that really exists and though the location has been prospected from the days of dr darwin french in eighteen sixty none have looked for it except the one who lost it in eighteen fifty he was john goller who came to california with the jayhawkers goller was a blacksmith and a wagon maker and was the first american to establish such a business in the pueblo of los angeles after convincing the native californian that his spoke-wheel wagon would function as effectively as the rounded slabs of wood the only vehicles then used he made a comfortable fortune and no one in the pueblo had a reputation for better character crossing the panamint goller though strong and husky became separated from his companions and barely escaped with his life coming down a panamint canyon he found some gold nuggets and filled his pockets with them 
after crossing panamint valley and the slate ridge he was found by mexican vaqueros of don ignacio del valle owner of the great camulos rancho after his recovery he proceeded to los angeles in showing the nuggets to friends he said i could have filled a wagon with them goller because of his means was soon able to take vacations which were devoted to looking for the lost location and though he searched for years he found no more nuggets finally he found a canyon which he believed might have been the site but no wagon load of nuggets john goller was a solid clear-thinking man not the type to chase the rainbow gold is known to exist in the canyon and some mines have been operated with varying success but none have been outstanding it is quite possible that cloudbursts for which the panamint is noted washed goller's gold away or buried it under an avalanche of rock dirt and gravel manley with his forgivable inclination to error refers to goller as galler and discounts the story some day said dr samuel slocum a man who made a fortune in gold somebody will find a fabulously rich mine in that canyon it is located about twelve miles south of ballarat and is called goller canyon one of the l's in goller's name having been dropped the lost spook a spiritualist with tuberculosis came to Ballarat and employed an Indian known as Joe Button as packer and guide. He told Joe to lead him to the driest spot in the country. Joe took him into the Cottonwood Range and left him. The invalid remained for several weeks, returned to Ballarat en route to San Bernardino, presumably for supplies. He was reticent as to his luck, but he had several small sacks filled with ore, and in his haste to catch the stage, dropped a piece of quartz from a loosely tied sack. It was almost solid gold and weighed eight ounces. While in San Bernardino, he died. His relatives sold the remaining ore, which yielded $7,200. They tried to find the claim, but failed. Shorty Harris heard of it months afterwards and looked up Joe Button. With his own burros, Joe's pack horses, and an Indian known as Ignacio, he set out. Cloudbursts had washed out the previous trails, filled gulches, leveled hills, and so transformed the country that the Indian was unable to find any trace of his previous course, gave up the hunt, and turned back. Shorty cached his supplies, and with the meager description Joe could give him, searched for weeks. At last he came upon a camp where he discovered a collection of pamphlets dealing with the occult, but no trails. It was apparent that these had been destroyed by floods, and for two months Shorty searched for the diggings. A brush pile aroused his suspicions, and removing it, he found the hole. The ore had Uncle Sam's eagle all over it, Shorty said, and the world was mine. I returned to my camp, started spending the money a million dollars for a rest home for old worn-out prospectors fifty thousand a year for all my pals shorty ate his supper spread his blankets and went to sleep with his dream in the middle of the night he awoke something was running over his blanket he raised up and in the moonlight recognized the only thing on earth he was afraid of the hydrophobic skunk i started packing right now shorty said and walked out there's a mine there and whoever wants it can have it i don't the lost canyon as some evidence of reality jack allen a miner and prospector of almost superhuman endurance got drunk at skidoo and filled with remorse and shame the morning after decided to leave and seek a job at the keen wonder mine about forty miles northeast across death valley to save distance allen took a short cut over sheep mountain and in going through a canyon he picked up a piece of quartz and seeing a flack of color he broke it excited by its apparent richness he filled his pockets noted his bearings and went on his way when he reached the keen wonder he took the ore to joe mcgilland the company's assayer who became more excited than the finder i'll put it in the button for half joe said allen agreed the assay showed values as high as twenty thousand dollars to the ton he closed his office and ran out to find jack working in the mine chuck this job he cried go back to that claim quick as you can get your monuments up and record the notices jack allen bought a burro loaded his supplies and went back only to discover that a cloudburst had destroyed all his landmarks 
both shorty harris and bob eichbaum who established stovepipe wells resort considered this the best chance among all the legends of lost mines it is wild rough and largely virgin country and because of that the hardiest prospectors always passed it by the lost johnny an indian known as johnny used to come into york's store at ballarat about once a month with gold in bullion form he would sell it to york or trade it for supplies frequently he had credits amounting to a thousand or more dollars other indians soon learned of johnny's mind and would trail him when he left town but none were able to outsmart him that it was near arastri springs was generally believed upon one occasion johnny was seen leaving the old arastre and disappear in the canyon immediately evidence that the arastre had been used within the hour was discovered for years no prospector worked in that region without keeping his eyes peeled for johnny's bonanza End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of loafing along death valley trails by william carruthers this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three panamint city genial crooks the first search for gold in death valley country was in panamint valley from the summit of the slate ridge on the road from trona one comes suddenly upon an enchanting and unforgettable view of the panamint if you are one who thrills at breathtaking scenery you will not speak you will stand and look and think your thoughts will be of dead worlds of the silence spread like a shroud over all that you see below a yellow road twists in and out of hidden dry washes around jutting hills to end in the green mesquite that hides the ghost town of ballarat there the panamint lifts two miles its gourd sides a riot of pasteled colors if you have coached yourself with trivia of history it will require imagination's aid to accept the fact that from this wasteland came fortunes and industries of world-wide fame from new york to san francisco on envied social thrones sit the children and grandchildren of those who with pick and shovel here dug the family fortune in ragged overalls only recently a descendant of one of these living in a city far removed informed me her mansion was for sale because the neighborhood is being ruined a sheep herder newly rich on war profits was moving in eleven miles north of ballarat surprise canyon which leads to panamint city opens on a broad alluvial fan that tilts sharply to the valley floor in april eighteen seventy three w t henderson whose first trip into death valley country was made to find the lost gun site came again with r v stewart and r c jacobs in surprise canyon they discovered silver which ran as high as four thousand dollars a ton and filed more than eighty location notices henderson was an adventurer of uncertain character who had roamed western deserts like a nomad during the indian war that threatened extermination of the white settlers in inyo county thieving charlie a piute was induced by outnumbered whites to approach his warring tribesmen under a flag of truce and succeeded in getting eleven of them to return with him to camp independence for a peace talk henderson with two companions waylaid and murdered them he had been a member of the posse organized by harry love to shoot on sight california's most famous bandit joaquin murrieta and boasted that he fired the bullet which killed the glamorous joaquin it was he who cut off and pickled the bandit's head as evidence to get the reward at the same time he pickled the hand of three-fingered jack garcia joaquin's chief lieutenant and the bloodiest monster the west ever saw garcia had an odd habit of cutting off the ears of his victims and stringing them for a saddle ornament the slaying of joaquin was not a pretty adventure and as the details came out henderson renounced the honor the gruesome vouchers which obtained the reward became the attraction for the morbid on a san francisco street and there above the din of traffic one heard a spieler chant the thrills it gave for only two measly bits the exhibit was destroyed in the san francisco fire and earthquake of nineteen o six 
in his book on the old west coast major horace bell states that henderson confided to him there was never a day nor night that joaquin murietta did not come to him and though headless would demand the return of his head that henderson was never frightened by the apparition which would vanish after henderson explained why he couldn't return the head and his excuse for cutting it off i would never have cut joaquin's head off except for the excitement of the chase and the orders of harry love to give credence to the ghost story he says of henderson he was for several years my neighbor and a more genial and generous fellow i never met major bell it is known was not always strictly factual following the surprise canyon strike panamint city was quickly built and quickly filled with thugs who lived by their guns gamblers and painted girls who lived by their wits an engaging sidewalk promoter known as e p rains who possessed a good front and gall in abundance but no money assured the owners of the panamint claims that he could raise the capital necessary for development he set out for the city registered at the leading hotel attached the title of a colonel to his name exchanged a worthless check for twenty five dollars and made for the barroom it was no mere coincidence that mr raines before ordering his drink parked himself alongside a group of the town's richest citizens and began to toy with an incredibly rich sample of ore it was natural that members of the group should notice it particularly the multimillionaire senator john p jones nevada silver king soon the charming crook was the life of the party his twenty-five dollars spent he actually borrowed a thousand dollars from jones having drunk his guests under the table mr raines went forth for further celebration and landed broke in the hooskow hearing of his misadventure his new friends promptly went to his rescue outrage biggest night the town has ever had to make amends for the city's inhospitable blunder, Rains was taken to his hostelry, given a champagne bracer, and made the honor guest at breakfast. "'Where's the senator?' he asked. Informed that Senator Jones had taken a train for Washington, Rains quickened, "'Why, he was expecting me to go with him.' He jumped up, fumbled through his pockets in a pretended search for money. "'Heavens, my purse is gone!' Instantly a half-dozen hands reached for the hip, and Mr. Raines was on his way. It required but a few moments to get $15,000 from the senator and his partner, Senator William R. Stewart, for the Panama claims. He also sold Jones the idea of a railroad from a seaport at Los Angeles to his mines, and this was partially built. The project ended at Cajon Pass. The scars of the tunnel started may still be seen jones and stewart organized the panamint mining company with a capital of two million dollars other claims were bought but immediate development was delayed by difficulties in obtaining title because many of the owners were outlaws difficult to find a few were located in the penitentiary and there received payment for some of the claims the promoters paid three hundred and fifty thousand dollars on june twenty ninth eighteen seventy five the first mill began to crush ore from the Jacobs Wonder Mine. Panamint City became one of the toughest and most colorful camps of the West. It was strung for a mile up and down narrow Surprise Canyon. It was believed that here was a mass of silver greater than that on the Comstock, and shares were active on the markets. The most pretentious saloon in the town was that of Dave Nagel, who later, as the bodyguard of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen J. Field, killed judge david terry distinguished jurist but stormy petrel of california vigilante days judge terry had represented then married his client the rose of sharon sarah althea hill in her suit to determine whether she was wife or mistress of senator sharon comstock millionaire feuding had resulted with field the trial judge Meeting in a railroad dining room, Judge Terry slapped Justice Field's face, and Nagel promptly killed Terry. Poker at Panamint City was never a piker's game. Bets of $10,000 on two pair attracted but little comment. Gunning was regarded as a minor nuisance, but funerals worried the town's butcher. He had the only wagon that had survived the steep canyon road into the camp. 
i bought it he complained to haul fresh meat but since there's no hers i never know when i'll have to unload a quarter of beef to haul a stiff to sourdough canyon panamint city attained an estimated population of three thousand harris and rhine merchants having the only safe in the town permitted patrons to deposit money for safe keeping and often had large sums on one occasion they had the ten thousand dollar payroll of the hemlock mine a clerk arriving early at the store suddenly faced two gentlemen who directed him to open the safe and pass out the money just as well counted as you fork it over one ordered the clerk had counted four thousand dollars when he was told to stop this'll do for the present the spokesman said we'll come back and get the rest yeah added the partner too damned many thugs in this town they sallied forth on a spending spree the down and out among the mile-long street received generous portions of the loot and a widow whose husband had been killed in a mine explosion received five hundred dollars these bandits small and macdonald thereafter became incredibly popular and the legend follows that what they stole from those who had they shared with those who had not wells fargo and company offered a reward of a thousand dollars for their capture but their arrest was never accomplished invariably they were apprised of the approach of pursuers and simply retired to some convenient canyon the bandits further endeared themselves to the citizenry when stewart and jones arranged for the importation of a hundred chinese laborers this aroused the ire of the white miners and a meeting was called to protest this is white man's town was the cry of labor small and macdonald agreed just leave it to us they told the leaders no use in a lot of fellows getting hurt they stationed themselves at the mouth of the canyon and when the coolies arrived a sudden volley from the bandit six guns brought the caravan to a halt the frightened chinamen leaped from the hacks and fled in panic across the desert and panamint remained a white man's town engaged at work around their hideout hungry bill stopped to beg for food they told the indian to wait until they finished their task his sullen impatience angered small who booted him down the trail hungry bill left cursing and told a prospector whom he met that he would return shortly with his tribesmen and assassinate the entire population panamint city was warned but small and macdonald declared that since they had started the trouble they alone should end it accordingly they set out for hungry bill's ranch to stop the attack before it started but near hungry bill's stone corral they were ambushed by the indians the bandits shot their way into the corral and barricading themselves killed and wounded about half of the renegades after which the remainder fled panamint city harbored a horde of unsung assassins who merely lay in wait shot the unwary victim down took his poke rolled the body into a ravine went up to town to spend the money one killer who came decided to dominate the field and with that in view he set forth to establish himself quickly as a gunman not to be trifled with he chose to display his prowess upon an inoffensive quiet faro dealer known as jimmy bruce who it was easy to see was just a chicken-livered punk the publicity of a well-done murder in such a setting would give prestige armed with two guns the bully contrived to start an argument with bruce the indoor white of the gambler seemed to grow whiter as the rage of his towering tormentor reached the climax the players moved out of range the bartenders ducked under the counter patrons helpless to intervene fled from the kill a shot rang out cautiously the bartenders lifted their heads on the floor lay the bad man mr bruce was calmly lighting a cigar there was consternation among the killers they swore vengeance after five of them had fallen before bruce's gun he was let alone the silent pharaoh dealer it was learned too late was surpassingly quick on the trigger a spot somewhat distant from the regular cemetery was chosen for the burial place and it became known as jim bruce's private graveyard remy nadeau a french canadian was the first to haul freight into panamint city nadeau was a genius of transportation there was no country too rough too remote too wild for him he came to los angeles in eighteen sixty one from utah and teamed as far east as montana 
the cerro gordo mine on the eastern side of owens lake in inyo county began to ship ore in eighteen sixty nine and nadeau obtained a contract to haul the ore to wilmington where it was shipped by boat to san francisco he soon had to increase his equipment to thirty two teams using more than five hundred animals for his return trip he bought such commodities as he could peddle or leave for sale at stations he built along the route in eighteen seventy two the contract having expired judson and belshaw owners of the mine received a lower bid and nadeau was left with five hundred horses on his hands and heavily in debt he wanted to dispose of his outfit for the benefit of his creditors but they had confidence in him and persuaded him to carry on borax discovered in nevada saved him meanwhile the lower bidder on the cerro gordo mine proved unsatisfactory and judson and belshaw asked nadeau to take the old job back but now nadeau informed them they would have to buy a half interest in his outfit and advance a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to construct relay stations at mud springs mojave lane springs red rock little lake cartago and other points they gladly agreed shortly after nadeau began hauling across the desert he picked up a man suffering from gunshot and crazed from thirst taking the victim to his nearest station he left instructions that he be cared for some time afterward one of nadeau's competitors whose trains had been held up several times by outlaws wondered why none of nadeau's teams or stations had been molested at the time nadeau himself didn't know that the fellow whom he'd picked up on the desert was tiburcio vasquez the bandit terror vasquez naively condoned his banditry it disgusted him at dances he said to see the senoritas of his race favor the interloping americans he had a singular power over women when sheriff william rowland effected his capture women of los angeles filled his cell with flowers he was hanged at san jose nadeau was now hauling ore from the minietta and the modoc mines in the argus range on the west side of panamint valley the modoc was the property of george hurst the father of the publisher william randolph hurst these mines were directly across the valley from panamint city and because of nadeau's record for building roads in places no other dared to go jones and stewart engaged him to haul out of surprise canyon which was barely wide enough in places for a burrow with a pack on a hill locally known as seventeen that being the percent of grade located on the old highway between ballarat and trona one may see the dim outline of a road pitching down precipitously to the valley floor this road was built by nadeau and one marvels that anything short of steam power could move a load from bottom to top acquiring a fortune nadeau built the first three-story building in los angeles and the nadeau hotel long the city's finest retained favor among many wealthy pioneer patrons long after the more glamorous angeles and alexandria were built in the early nineteen hundreds the first ore from the panamint mines was shipped to england and because of its richness showed a profit but difficulties arose in recovery processes which they did not know how to overcome the mines would have paid fabulously under present-day processes Finney's was written to the story of Panamint after two hectic years, and in 1877, Jones and Stewart had lost $2 million and quit. It would be more factual to state that since they had received from the public $2 million to put into it, who lost what is a guess. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four Indian George Legend of the Panamint. The previous chapter records accepted history of the silver discovery at Panamint City. Indian George Hansen had another version which he told me at his ranch, eleven miles north of Ballarat. It fits the period and the people then in the country george when a youngster lived in the coso range east of the coso range there was no white man for a hundred miles and renegades fleeing from their crimes and deserters from the union army sought hideouts in the panamint 
thus george was employed as a guide by three outlaws to lead them to safe refuge george a shoshone had both friends and relatives among the shoshones and the paiutes and took the bandits into surprise canyon where a camp for the night was chosen while staking out his pack animals george discovered a ledge of silver ore breaking off a chunk he stuck it into his pocket saying nothing about it until they were out of the locality then he showed the specimen and to promote a deal gave one of them a sample they wanted to see the ledge but george refused to disclose it then george said the three fellows stepped aside and after talking in whispers told him they didn't like the country and returning with him to the coso range went on their way two or three months later they were back to bargain george had traded with the white man before they had always given him a few dollars and a rosy promise now me pretty foxy so i say no want money maybe lose him say what hell you want heap good job all time i live okay him say we give you job i show claim george paused a look of smouldering hate in his dark eyes then added i get job two weeks him say you fired i get fifty dollars all indians and many of the old timers believed that the ledge george found was that for which jones and stewart paid two million dollars george made another deal worthy of mention the town of trona on searles lake needed the water owned by george's relative mabel who herded five hundred goats and sold them to butchers at skidoo goldfield and rhyolite where they became veal steak or lamb chops trona offered thirty dollars a month for the use of the water mabel consulted george as head man of the shoshones and advised trona that the sum would not be considered it must pay twenty seven fifty or do without a superstition regarding numbers accounted for the price george fixed for the water my acquaintance with indian george began on my trip to ballarat with shorty harris and was the result of a stomach ache shorty had i suggested a trip to the doctor at trona instead no sir i'll see old indian george if these doctors knew as much as these old indians there wouldn't be any cemeteries i asked what evidence he had of george's skill plenty you know spark plug uh, michael sherlock he was in a bad way fred gray put a mattress in his pickup laid spark plug on it and hauled him over to trona nurses took him inside doctor looked him over and came out and asked fred if he knew where old spark plug wanted to be buried why ballarat i reckon fred said well you take him back quick he'll be dead when you get there better hurry he'll spoil on you this hot weather fred raced back taking curves on seventeen with two wheels hanging over the gorge but he made it stopped in front of spark plug's shack jumped out and called to me to bring a pick and shovel then he ran over to bob warnick's shack for help to make a coffin indian george happened to ride by the pickup and saw spark plug's feet sticking out he crawled off his cayuse took a look lifted spark plug's eyelids and leaving his horse ground hitched he went out in the brush and yanked up some roots here and there then he went up to hungry hatties and came back with a handful of chicken guts and rabbit pellets brewed em in a tomato can and when he got through he funneled it down spark plug's throat and in no time at all spark plug was up and packing his flivver to go prospecting if you don't believe me there's spark plug right over there tinkering with his car george's age had been a favorite topic of writers of death valley history for the last thirty years i stopped for water once at a little stream flumed out of hall's canyon to supply the ranch he was irrigating his alfalfa in a temperature of a hundred and twenty two degrees i had brought him three or four dozen oranges and suggested that mabel would like some of the fruit heavy work for a man of your age i said he bit into an orange eating both peeling and pulp me papoose me only a hundred and seven years old there were less than a dozen oranges left when i began to cast about for a tactful way to preserve a few for mabel seeing her chopping wood in the scorching sun i said i'll bet mabel would like an orange just now shall i call her no no george grunted oranges heap bad for squaw and speeding up his eating he removed the last menace to mabel once george told me of watching the sufferings of the jayhawkers and bennett arcane party me little boy first time i see white man whiskers make me think him devil i run i see some of bennett party die when all dead we go down first time indians ever see flower 
squaws think it what make white men white and put it on their faces i asked george why he didn't go down and aid the whites why he asked to get shot how many shoshones are left i asked george he counted them on his fingers nineteen soon none george died in nineteen forty four and it is safe i believe to say that for a hundred and ten years he had baffled every agency of death on america's worst desert because his ranch was a landmark and the water that came from the mountains was good it was a natural stopping place and he was known to thousands following a curious custom of indians george adopted the swedish name hansen because it had euphony he liked the Panamint is the locale of the legend of Swamper Ike, first told, I believe, by Old Ranger over a nationwide hookup while he was MC of the program Death Valley Days. A daring but foolhardy youngster with wife and baby undertook to cross the range. Unacquainted with the country and scornful of its perils, he reached the crest, but there ran out of water. He left his wife and baby on the trail, comfortably protected in the shade of a bluff, and started down the Death Valley side of the range to find water. After a thorough search of the canyons about, he climbed to a higher level, scanned the floor of the valley. Seeing a lake that reflected the peaks of the funeral range, he made for it under a withering sun. He learned too late that it was a mirage, and exhausted, started back only to be beaten down and die. After wading through a night of terror, the young mother prepared a comfortable place for her baby and went in search of her husband. She, too, saw the blue lake and made for it, saw it vanish as he had. Then she discovered his tracks and undertook to follow him, but she also was beaten down and fell dead within a few feet of his lifeless body. A band of wandering Cocopa Indians crossing the range found the baby, they took the child to their own habitation on the Colorado River and named him Joe Salsapuedas, which is Indian for get out if you can. Joe grew up as Indian, burned dark by the desert sun, but he had an idea he wasn't Indian. Learning that he was a foundling picked up in the Panamint, he set out for Death Valley, possessed of a singular faith that somehow he would discover evidence that he was a white man. He obtained a job as swamper for the Borax Company. When he gave his name, the boss said, Too many Joes working here. We'll call you Ike. Early Indians, as you may see in Dead Man's Canyon, the Valley of Fire, and numerous canyons in the western desert, had a habit of scratching stories of adventure or signs to inform other Indians of unusual features of a locality on the canyon walls often coloring the traces with dyes from herbs or roots. Knowing this, Swamper Ike was always alert for these hieroglyphs on any boulder he passed or in any canyon he entered. One day, Swamper Ike went out to look for a piece of onyx that he could polish and give it to the girl he loved. While seeking the onyx, he noticed a flat slab of travertine and on it the picture story of a Get Out If You Can. Swamper Ike had justified his faith. End of chapter 24